that before I ever had a need, God already knew it. And before I ever saw the answer, God already provided it. No matter what I go through, I'm going to make it. You're going to make it. And if we don't, hallelujah, we get to go to heaven. Unless you're a Longhorn fan, then we're praying. <laughs> we, we don't know. We don't know. Not going to judge. Not judging. But let's go to the Lord in prayer right now. And if you can remember some of these things, if the Lord lays them on your heart, keep them lifted up in prayer. And Lord God, we thank you for this day. And God, I'm going to thank you in advance right now. I know we've already had some sprinkles. But God, I'm praying for a good rain through this week. God, we got rain chances several days this week, and I'm going to believe right now for good rain. And Father, we're going to lift all these needs up to you. Lord, every physical need that's been mentioned, Lord God, those that are dealing with uh, uh, issues pertaining with uh, mental struggles, emotional struggles, financial job, uh, um, passing away, Lord God, we, we just lift all these needs up to you because they're yours. Lord, we thank you for the praise reports because, God, those are good. Those are good. We need to remember, oh, yeah, God did answer that prayer. I forgot to tell everybody, but, yeah, God did meet my need. And, Father, we need to remember that. And, Father, as we lift these needs up to you, Lord, what I'm declaring right now is that all these needs are is an opportunity for a testimony. Something good is going to happen on the other side of this, Lord Jesus. That's going to build our faith, and the story we share from it is going to build other people's faith. And Father, I'm just thanking you right now because you're a good God, and something good is going to happen. Satan, we rebuke you right now in the name of Jesus from our families and our homes and our situations. And we declare right now the power of Almighty God to be moving in our lives, surrounding us, reminding this world we still have a God that lives. And Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the time we have. Be in every class. <clears throat> be with everybody that's here. Lord, let us glean from your word today. And Father, I pray let us be able to leave here today, not just full on food, but full on your word. And God, we want to give you thanks and praise right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Had a had a friend and one of one of her friends show up at my parents' house last night. And uh, church I used to be on staff at in Harker Heights, we moved to Arkansas, but I, we would come home every Christmas to spend Christmas with my parents. That pastor would go somewhere else for Christmas, and so every Christmas I'm filling the pulpit at our old church uh, uh, for them. And this woman told the story last night of how after prayer, uh, we had an altar time, and uh, like, kind of like what we do here, we have people to pray for. And uh, it was a candlelight service, Christmas Eve, that sort of thing. And she came forward, and I don't even remember this. I, I, don't, I don't remember it at all because uh, it's been year, some years ago, and uh, eight years or whatever. But she said she came down to the front, and, uh, and she said, you told me that the Lord told you to tell me this is what you're going through and said this, God told me to tell you He is this to you. He is this to you. He is this to your children. He is this. And she said, you don't know me. You didn't know my circumstances, but every one of those things you hit was what was going on in mine and my family's life. And she started sharing the stories this is what we were going through. This is what we were going through. This is what we were going through. Listen, if God burns in you to speak to somebody, to pray for somebody, to encourage somebody, you got to remember, God was setting it up and then put you in the path to make a difference. I don't remember it. I don't know what I said. But apparently God did something that day. And I want to encourage you. That's... That's not just something, I, I praise the Lord, my praise report, but that's, that doesn't celebrate the vessel. That celebrates the king because he knows what he's doing. The only problem is, is he's got to use us. There is no plan B. You are plan A. And God wants to use you. So 
Remember that. Go ahead and turn with me in your Bibles. We're going to be looking at Revelations chapter number 2, <clears throat> starting in verse 18. This is going to be wrapping up uh, chapter 2. and We'll start chapter 3 next week. And, uh, just a couple of items going into uh, um, just some announcements real quick. Don't forget, tomorrow is the National Day of Prayer. In your bulletin, you received, uh, Lynn put one of the inserts in your bulletin, had seven things. The National Day of Prayer organization I've worked with for years, and they have seven different areas that they ask people to be praying over. And so uh, if, if you have your bulletin, be sure and check it out. There may still be some extra ones out there on the table. But uh, uh, tomorrow is a day when Christians all over America are going to be praying for America. And how do you know America is needing some prayer right now? Hello, somebody. And so uh, be, sure and, be sure and avail yourself to that. Um, we've got... Uh, the youth are going to be having a car wash at Vera Bank in Florence on May the 11th from 8 to 4. So if you want to go out and help them out with that, they would greatly appreciate it. This coming Sunday starts our membership class. If anybody's not a member and you want to be a member, um, uh, we'll start that class. It'll be this Sunday during Sunday school. It's seven weeks long, and uh, we'll actually be in here in the sanctuary. We do not have enough classrooms on Sunday morning for Sunday school. That's a good problem, people. That's a very good problem. And uh, so we're excited about that. Right now we've got at least 12 I know of that are going to be going through the class. There is out there in the, in the, uh, on the bulletin board, there's some sign-up sheets that are out there. And um, when we do our rodeo, the clean rodeo's coming up. Don't forget to get your tickets. Go out there, have a good time. Yeehaw with us. I love the clean rodeo. I, I think it's a great time. But we are doing, our church is doing the Special Hearts Rodeo for special needs kids and families. And so it's, a, it's, it's nothing more than, uh, you know, Maxdale Cowboy Church, you know, Fall Fest. It's a lot of our stuff that we already do. But we need some help. There's, there's no major thing. You may be helping a, helping a kid throw a lasso at a hay bale. Uh, you may be uh, helping some kid with a stick horse. Uh, depending on what these special needs kids can do, uh, you know, we, we're, we've got these different stations for them to have fun. The little bucket bulls we're going to have here Sunday, don't forget, PBR, this coming Sunday, wear your boots and hats and come celebrate these kids as they hop around on here. The, uh, but, you know, something like that. If you can help us out, that'll be on, and there is an insert in your bulletin, that will be on May the 18th from 10 to noon. And uh, not a lot of work, we just, but we do need some hands. And uh, this is going to be a major outreach for us to impact people and families. Because how many know they need to know about Jesus Christ too? I am not above using rodeo to share Jesus Christ. Not at all. So uh, um, anybody that can help us with that, you can, you can donate an hour, you can donate a couple hours. Uh, I promise you, it will make a difference. And just a reminder that on May 25th, on Saturday, we will be having the memorial service for Francis Young here at the church. And uh, um, uh, Miss Martha Shreve is going to be heading up uh, stuff for lunch. It'll be at 11 o'clock. We're going to be providing lunch for the family. And uh, so uh, just wanted you to be able to come out and celebrate a precious lady. I love that lady. And uh, us going out to Bubba's 33, can't none of us here worth a hoot. And we're at Bubba's 33. Have you ever eaten at Bubba's 33? It ain't quiet. It ain't quiet. That in Texas Roadhouse, if you can't hear worth a hoot, don't go to either place. <laughs> Just going down to Olive Garden, it's a lot quieter. A lot quieter. But um, the uh, interesting thing happened. My wife... Uh, with her blood pressure issues. And uh, she went to the doctor, and the doctor had told her, said, you have got to get the stress out of your life. You've got to get rid of stress. How many know stress will kill you? Yeah. Ever since then, she's been looking at me weird. <laughs> so I, 
I am I am at I don't remember Lowe's Home Depot or something, and we live in a we live in a, in a uh, fifth wheel travel trailer, and I found this attachment that goes on the sink where you can actually have a foot one of those food disposal things that will work in an RV, and uh, uh, and I was like, man, this is awesome, and uh, so I called my wife and I and I was telling her I said they make this this food disposal unit for an RV. And it'll grind up everything. It'll even grind up bones. And she said, finger or femur? Because that makes a difference. <laughs> and I said, um, maybe chicken? And she said, oh yeah, that's probably what it means. So I want you to be praying, not only for my wife, but would you pray for my protection as she's trying to get some of the stress out of her life. And if I show up missing, what are you pointing at? Oh, it's been recorded. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. You can't do anything because I got witnesses. There you go. There you go. Bless her heart. Bless her heart. Yeah, the old saying, pray for your pastor's wife. There's nothing wrong with her. She's just married to the preacher. <laughs> you know, It's a thing. It is. So we're looking at Christ's message to the seven churches, and we're dealing with the church of Thyatira. And uh, this particular message is exciting to me because it's more of a normal middle-of-the-road type of church. It's more like an us kind of church. and You'll see why in just a minute. Um, with the exception of the whole Jezebel thing, and that's a thing. Uh, but this is the longest letter of, of all the seven churches. This is the longest one. And uh, uh, God speaks highly of their works, and that's a good thing. And the promises that God gives them at the very end are very powerful. They're they're. They're incredible. And uh, so as we continue on with this series, with each church we look at, um, you know, we're either having to change to conform to God's desires uh, or to just kind of put up that that wall that, hey, we're not going to move from here and become that. I want us, our church to be the healthiest church it can be. I don't ask God to make us the largest church in this area. I don't. But I'll tell you what I do want it to be. I want it to be the healthiest church in this area. You know why? Because we're the healthiest church in this area. Maybe we can help other churches get healthy. Sickness is not the only thing contagious. Health can be contagious as well. Just as anger can be contagious, laughter can be contagious. And we're just believing that as God makes us a healthier church, it can help other churches get healthy as well. And it's something that we have to do if we want to see it in our church. we got to see it in us first. Why? Because you're the church. You're the church. I've never seen a church with health issues that had healthy people. If a church has health issues... It's because people are unhealthy. It could be the pastor. It could be certain individuals. It could be a, a clique of a group or some sort. But can I tell you, when we're all following after Jesus Christ, He's going to make this church healthy. Come on, somebody. And I want to have a healthy church. Because I'll tell you right now, a healthy church is a happy church. And I like being happy. Hallelujah. And I don't want us to settle for mediocrity. I'm telling you right now, if this church ever gets to the point where we're not going to take chances, I don't want to be a part of it. I want to be a church that takes chances. I don't want to be foolish, but at the same time, I don't want to be mediocre. I don't want to be mediocre. I was told today, as a matter of fact, uh, um, I'm not going to tell you who told it to me, Brooke Andrews, but... Got a text today and said, do you know why the Oklahoma license plate says Oklahoma is okay? And I said, no. Why is that? She said, because they don't know how to spell mediocre. <laughs> 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 I 
<laughs> Bless my spirit. I don't want to be a church that's mediocre. I want us thriving at our best. I want us doing. I want us working. I want us succeeding. Because I want to hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant. If you remember, it was the servants that got... Mm, the preacher's coming on me. When the servants got hold of the talents and they did something with it, God blessed them. But the one that buried it, the one that said, I'm just going to make do, I'm just going to coast along, was the one that got in trouble. I will tell you right now, if you want to have a healthy church, you want to have a strong church, if you want to have a powerful church, it's a church that's messy. It's a church that's busy. And it's full of tired people. Are you hearing me? Man, you got eternity to rest. You got eternity to rest. Use it all up right now. I'm telling you, summer's coming up. And when summer gets here, take your vacations. I'm telling you right now, get out of town. Go somewhere. Vacate. Because when you come back, you belong to me. We're going to work. There's an old Icelandic proverb that says, mediocrity is climbing molehills without sweating. Mediocrity is climbing molehills without sweating sweating. It reminds me of, if you've ever been through Clarendon, Texas, up in, towards the Panhandle, you go through Clarendon, Texas. I don't know if it's still there, but there used to be. You go through West Texas, I mean, you'll go miles and miles between towns. I mean, there's nothing out in a lot of those places. So when you hit a little hole in the road like Ding Dong, there's probably going to be a hotel there because you never know when you're going to see the next town. And in Clarendon, Texas, they had a little motor, one of those little motels and it was called the It'll Do Motel. Was it a good one? I don't know. It'll do. You know, I don't want people to say, well, what kind of church is Maxdale Cowboy Church? Ah, it'll do. You hear me? I don't want people to I don't want people asking you, saying, Man, what kind of pastor y'all got over at the church? Oh, he'll do. Say that to my face. That's fine. Just don't say that to other people. I don't want to be that. Are you hearing me? I don't want to be that kind of man. I don't want to be that kind of husband. I don't want to be that kind of father. I'd rather put in the extra effort and, and do well. So as we continue in studying these churches of Revelation, again, the four things that we want you to see. First of all is a revelation of what Jesus Christ Himself loves and values in his churches. Because how you know this is his church? Amen. It don't belong to Mike Sullivan. It don't belong to any of the board members. It don't belong to nobody except him. And God has a plan. And he's trying to show us what he loves and values in his churches as well as what he hates and condemns. Secondly, a clear statement of what, of, from Jesus regarding the consequences of disobedience and spiritual neglect. And he rewards spiritual commitment and faithfulness to Christ. A third thing that we see is a standard by which any church or individual may judge their true spiritual walk with God. And lastly, I want you to see the example of the methods that Satan uses to attack the church and attack his people. Satan wants to interrupt the good stuff. You heard me say it before. If, God, if Satan can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. Satan wants to interrupt every good thing in your life. So let's take a look at the, the, uh, the fourth church, the church of Thyatira, starting chapter 2, starting in verse number 18. Write this letter to the angel of the uh, church of Thyatira. This is the message from the Son of God, whose eyes are like flames of fire, his feet are like polished bronze. Uh, I know all the things you do. I have seen your love, your faith, your service, and your patient endurance. I can see your constant improvement in all these things. Wow. But I have this complaint against you. You are permitting that woman, that Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet, to lead my servants astray. She teaches them to commit sexual sin and to eat food offered to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she does not want to turn away from her immorality. Therefore, I will throw her on a bed of suffering, and those who commit adultery with her will suffer greatly unless they repent and turn away from her evil deeds. I will strike her children. What? Amen. Woo! I just love the Bible. 
He encourages me so much. Jesus said, I'm going to kill them. I won't kill them. Then all the churches will know that I am the one who searches out the thoughts and the intentions of every person. And I will give to each of you whatever you deserve. Wow. But I also have a message for the rest of you in Thyatira who have not followed the false teaching, the deeper truths as they call them, depths of Satan actually. I will ask nothing more of you except that you hold tightly to what you have until I come. To all who are victorious, who obey me to the very end. To them I will give authority over all the nations. They will rule the nations with an iron rod and smash them like clay pots. They will have the same authority I received from my Father, and I will also give them the morning star. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what He is saying to the churches. Wow. Man, that's a powerful stuff. Powerful stuff. So, dealing with Thyatira, just to give you a little bit of a background on this particular community. It's located in the province of Asia Minor, known as Lydia. It's modern-day Turkey, but uh, back in that day, it was known as Lydia, and uh, on the Lycus River. It was on an inland route about 45 minutes due east of Pergamos, one of the ones we've talked about already, and about 60 miles from the sea. And although it's not a great city like the others that we've studied, I mean, there, there's no big major thing there. It did have some importance with commerce in wool, linen, apparel, uh, dyed stuff. Remember that, the, the, the whole uh, uh, industry of dyeing material. Uh, they had leather work, tanning, and an excellent bronze work district, uh, uh, brass and bronze. This was definitely a blue-collar, hard-working man town. Okay? This was a redneck place. They worked. Don't call me sir, I work for a living. Let me know what I'm talking about. That was this kind of a community. And uh, so it, it wasn't all polished and well-to-do like some of the others we talked about. This one was actually uh, uh, just, just a more common town. It, it was associated with commerce uh, through extensive trade guilds. Uh, call them labor union networks. There was a lot of labor union networks uh, in that area which probably played a prominent role with the social, political, economic, and even the religious things uh, of the city. Religiously, the city was important, though, uh, or it was, excuse me, it was actually unimportant, but there was two that they did have a pretty good-sized temple of. One was to Apollo, and the other one was Artemis, or Diana, was prominent. Now, some of you may recall, if you've read the book of Acts, you remember Paul got in some trouble. Paul got in trouble with the Bronze Work Guild. Why? Because he was talking bad about the goddess Diana. Remember that? That was probably either this community or one just like it. Okay, but it was, it was that same sort of thing was found here. Each labor union had its own god, and uh, because of whatever deity that labor union had, they had, fa uh, they had feasts, they had seasonal activities, and again... It's the day in which it was. There was a whole lot of sexual revelries that took place. I mean, a lot of nasty stuff that took place. And that's important to remember because of why God got onto the church. Now, the church itself in Thyatira, when you start looking at the believers that lived there, there was an existing church that seemed to be thriving at some point. We don't know who started the church. We don't know how it came to be, although it's believed possibly that some of Paul's converts out of Ephesus, had went out and evangelized Thyatira. Uh, Acts chapter 19 verse 10 uh, alludes to this. Acts chapter 16 verse 14 mentions a woman named Lydia. Okay, Now what was the name of the area that Thyatira is in? Lydia. And so it's not uncommon for those names to be used like that. Here's a woman named Lydia, and she's described as a seller of purple. Remember that? Well, what was one of the main chief industries there? The dyeing industry. And uh, uh, she made garments uh, through dyes using that particular one was called turkey red. It came out, uh, came out purple. She was probably a part of the dyer's guild. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, don't know that she was in Thyatira, but she may have come from Thyatira. And uh, that may be part of 
how the gospel got sent back there. Today, this city is actually known in, in Turkey as uh, Akaiser. And uh, it's, it's still a legitimate city today. So let's dive in. Let's dive in and see what God was saying. We're going to look at the greeting here. And uh, every one of these has a greeting. Jesus speaks to them. And uh, we're going to look at verse number 18 where it says this. Write this letter to the angel of the church of Thyatira. This is a message from the Son of God whose eyes are like flames of fire and whose feet are like polished bronze. It's interesting that in the three prior greetings, Jesus describes himself as he. But in this one right here, he comes right out and he calls himself the Son of God. Do you see that? Where it says this message is from who? doesn't say he who is among the lampstands, he who is the bright morning star, whatever. He, he, he calls himself by name. I mean, he throws it out there. This is from me, the Son of God. It's the only time that he ever actually uses his name like that uh, in these letters. This is a term for the Messiah, meaning that there may have been Jews in the church or in the area that were having trouble accepting Jesus in this role. There were probably others in the church that were uh, enticed towards emperor worship because one of the names for Caesar was Son of God. They would call Caesar the Son of God. And so Jesus would come right out and because this is the God I serve. Ah, listen up here. I'm the Son of God. I'm the Son of God. Not Him. I am. Just like God to set folks straight. Now there's this interesting thing where He talks about the eyes that are like fire. And they represent God's penetrating gaze. God's eye is always on us. But if you look at fire throughout the Bible, fire is representative of judgment. And so this looks like the eyes of judgment are on you. His discernment into our minds and into our hearts. I see you. Have you seen these little things that you can put up on a door frame or this little sticker you put out on your car? It looks like Jesus is looking around the corner saying, I saw that. <laughs> Have you seen that? I want to put one of those on my truck so bad. Jesus sees us. He sees us. He sees what we're doing, good or bad. And this was especially for those, this term eyes of fire is for those that are being led astray by the false prophetess Jezebel. This description of Jesus is actually also found. Daniel chapter 10 verse 6, it says this about him as well as in chapter 19, verse 12, the triumphal entry of Jesus, that, or when He, when he comes back again uh, on horseback. Isn't that just like cowboy Jesus? He's coming with His army on horseback. And uh, in there, it describes Him as having eyes like fire. Again, why? Judgment is coming. Judgment's coming. Now, it talks about His feet. This, the newer, newer translations call it polished bronze. Uh, if you have an older translation, it calls it burnished bronze. And this is bronze that when it's placed in the fire, it's so white, it's, 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 uh, it's so hot, it's white and glowing. It's so hot, hot. Jesus standing in that place of judgment. I mean, the fire, the power, it's so hot. His feet are like white and glowing. That's what that burnished bronze, the polished bronze what it means. This is also found speaking of in Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel 8 and Daniel chapter 10. It represents the triumphal judgment of those who are unbelieving or unfaithful to Jesus Christ. I have, we, we have synonyms like this. I put my foot down on that. You know what I'm saying? My, my, I am planted on this. You know, when you see somebody get mad and they just, that's redneck, man. That's redneck. What does that mean? I ain't moving and you better back up because you're about to make me mad. Spirit of slap's about to come on me. <laughs> that was the picture of Jesus standing there with these feet of judgment firmly rooted. I am in authority. I am in control. It's very... Very intimidating picture, actually. And uh, uh, the powerful feet, they're an immovable, and uh, that His power rules over all the world. And uh, Now this was actually very, could be very much an attraction, talking about these bronze feet 
because what was one of the major guilds that was in the town? Bronze workers. And so this is, a, here's an appeal. Jesus said, hey, I am the God with bronze feet. Oh, hey, we can identify with that. How do we know there's always something attractive about Jesus that appeals to who you are? There's always something. Jesus is appealing to everyone. I don't know how He does it. I don't know how He does it. Man, I can't get everybody to like me. I can't even get a third of the people to like me. But Jesus has this ability to make everybody identify with Him. Whether you like Him or not, you can identify with Him. Now He gives His commendation. I love this about Him because He's going to say something good. Say something good. And uh, so in verse 19 He says, I know all the things you do. I've seen your love, your faith, your service, and your patient endurance. And I can see your constant improving in all these things. Jesus was seeing a couple things in them. They were true in love, which can be seen in their works of service. You don't do this kind of work just for kudos and attaboys. You do it because of love. I mean, why on earth would you get up early in the morning and come mow the grass at the church? Why would, why would you stay up late helping decorate stuff in the church? Because you're working off your sins? Well, it <laughs> could be a thing. But it's really because of your love. Your love for God and His church. And so this was something that Jesus saw in them. And they had a true faithfulness through their perseverance through the trials that they faced. Also, they had made outstanding progress in their work. They're continuing to improve at their service, their acts of love to those around us. And Jesus was saying, hey, good job. I love a God who will point out the positives in my life. Tell me something good about me, and then I'll let you talk bad about me. It's all right. But let me know I did something right. For, have you ever looked at somebody and just asked them, do I do anything right in your eyes? You know what I'm saying? That's not the God we serve. If you hear God as constantly nagging, 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 I'll tell you, you're not hearing God. Because that's not who God is. Will God correct you? Yes. But God is a source of encouragement. Amen, brother. That's good preaching. Okay. Okay. But now here comes the criticisms. Here comes the things that they did wrong. Starting in verse uh, 20. But I have this complaint against you. You're permitting that woman, that Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet, to lead my servants astray. She teaches them to commit sexual sin and eat food offered to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she does not want to turn away from her uh, immorality. Therefore, I'll throw her on a bed of suffering. Those who commit adultery with her will suffer greatly unless they repent and turn away from her evil deeds. I will strike her children dead. Then all the... Ch all the churches will know that I am the one who searches out the thoughts and intentions of every heart, and I will give to each one of you whatever you deserve. Have you remember in Acts, I think it's Acts 5, Ananias and Sapphira? They lied. They lied. Some of you have told some whoppers today. They lied. And God killed them. Struck them dead. As Jerry Clower says, graveyard dead. And it's amazing what happened. Conviction and the fear of the Lord fell on everybody. Why? Because they didn't take God seriously. They didn't think God is who He is and He says what He means. They had allowed a female prophetess to be a part of them remaining among them and continuing to teach the saints that it was all right to indulge in sexual immorality and to eat the food that is sacrificed to idols. Now we talked about some of this, okay? That whole eating the food sacrificed to idols, Paul dealt with it. You remember me talking about that? Paul dealt with it saying, don't do it if it's going to cause somebody else to stumble. But where do you especially not do it at? Where they're sacrificing it. You don't go into the temple of whatever, Artemis, Apollo. You don't go into those places and be a part of those things and eat that food. Now if it's sacrificed on an altar, winds up on the market and they're selling it out there on the street, fine, buy it. 
But don't do it if it's going to cause somebody to stumble. But definitely don't do it if you're in their house. That's what's happening right here. That's what Jesus is getting on to them for. Is because you're eating the food sacrificed to idols and you're committing sexual immorality. Where? Among them. You're part of the church, but you're out there. The genuine gift and calling of a prophet is, was highly respected in that day. You had, uh, along with the apostles, the teachers, and the elders, prophets were elevated in, uh, in places of leadership in the church. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Ephesians chapter 4 point this out. Prophets were good people, and I'll tell you right now, prophets still exist. They still exist. People get nervous when you walk up and say, Hi, how are you? My name is Prophet Mike Sullivan. Whoa! Nobody calls himself apostle. Nobody calls himself prophet. But I will tell you, all five of those things still exist today. Tell me, when people say, Well, those gifts died with the apostles. Tell me any other gift that died with the apostles. None. So why on earth would those gifts die with the apostle? I'll take it a step further. All five of those need to be in every church. They need to be in every church. The prophet has a role to play. A prophet is a teacher. A prophet's whole, uh, whole office is to take the mysterious things of God and make them known to you. Whether it's the mysteries in the Word or if it's God giving a word about what's about to happen. So you had prophets. And, and uh, prophets with these direct revelations. So do not associate when you read this that prophets uh, are bad people. They, they do wrong things. Uh, I, I do get nervous because I've had to be around some weirdos. Woo! Man, if you're in a Pentecostal church, you get around some weirdos from time to time. You Baptists have no clue what some of us, you Church of Christ have no clue what some of us had nutcases we've had to deal with. But some, I got some amens off of that. Y'all dealt with them too. But can I tell you, I don't have to walk up to you and tell you I'm a prophet. God will validate that. Just like, ladies, you don't need to go up to somebody and say, I'm a lady. If you got to tell folks you're a lady, you're probably not a lady. If I got to remind people I'm a man, I'm probably not a man. I'm a boy, not a man. Do you hear what I'm saying? And so when you got to go around and flex your spiritual muscles and tell people, this is my office, this is who I am. Listen, people will know that gift is on you just by how you live and the track record of what you've done. So prophets still exist. Don't throw that away. This is also not a slam on women in ministry or in the prophetic. As a matter of fact, I will tell you right now, that when it comes to prophetic ministry, women tend to do better than men. Because women have this thing called intuition. They feel things. Men, let's be honest. We open the refrigerator door and we can't find a ketchup bottle. It's been in the same place for three weeks. And we can't find it. And I... I I think sometimes my wife comes in there, babe, I can't find this. I think sometimes she, she kind of sees I'm not looking. At it. She'll, Look, here it is. I told you it was right here. I can't prove it, but I'm, I'm, I'm leaning that way. Sometimes men can't find it. Can't, can't, they can't find nothing. That's not saying men can't. Some people are gifted towards that end. The downside, and I'm not here to, I'm not here to disparage anybody. But sometimes, ladies, sometimes when you're in a place of authority, you use your authority wrong. Well, I'm a woman having to compete in a man's world. This is not a man's world. It's not supposed to be. This is God's world. When God gives you a word, you give that word out of love, not a closed fist. Be very gentle with what you're doing. This woman he calls Jezebel. Nobody knows what her name is, but you get an idea of who she is because he calls her Jezebel. Obviously demonstrated there were some giftings in her life. There were giftings. Do you realize everybody here is born with gifts from God? Saddam Hussein had gifts from God. 
Otherwise, how would he have been so charismatic? Adolf Hitler. How on earth could that joker do what he did? And he perpetuated this myth of, a, of this great race. They're tall, blue-eyed, and blonde-haired. And he was short, dark-haired, and ugly. He didn't even fit his own role model. And people followed him to their death. Why? Because there were spiritual giftings there. Listen to me. You were made by God for God. We all have gifts. The question is, will you use them for good or evil? Jezebel, this woman, had gifts. The problem was is that she was using them for herself and not for God. Because unfortunately, people in church do that. Not Maxdale Cowboy Church. Hallelujah! But people do that. Pastors do that. Board members do that. Teachers do that. Grandmas and grandpas of the church do that. You want to know who the bell cow is? Let a questionable decision be made and see who everybody turns to. Where's my old folk at? Come on. How do you remember, have you remember the commercial of E.F. Hutton? You younger ones missed something. Well, I was talking to my broker today, E.F. Hutton, and E.F. Hutton said, man, what a powerful commercial. What a powerful commercial. If you got a gift, God's going to make sure people know you are who you are. She was using her gift for herself. And only a small portion saw through her deception. The rest followed her and ignored her views without objecting. They either bought into it, why? Because they're shallow and don't know the word. Or they were just flesh filled. I go to church, but man, I, I still do this, 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 this. For the, that term, the eyes of blazing fire, for them to expose her completely, Jesus calls her Jezebel. After King Ahab's wife that led Israel away from God. Her teachings were the same as the Nicolaitans, same as the Balaamites, remember? We talked about this. These were the ones that in Ephesus and Pergamos were leading people away from God. Leading people away from God. Bear in mind that this is a if it feels good, do it mentality. Well, God knows my heart. Yeah, I'm misbehaving, but you know what? God knows my heart. How do you just love it when people say that? Because the Bible says, for the heart is above all things most evil. God does know our hearts. And so she's, she's got the same teaching, the same message of turning people away from God. They believe the body is evil, so evil or good performed is still evil. You're just bad. This is what they taught. You're bad, and if you do bad things, you're bad. But even if you do good things, it's still bad. Why? Because you're bad. And anything you do is going to be bad. So just do that which is easier. You, to sin by nature. Just do that and enjoy it. This is the same argument that you get from people kind of like those that back in the day, the liberals that were pushing for contraceptives to be placed out in the schools. Remember that? Well, you're going to do it anyway. So we want you to have these things. How do you know it should be? No, don't do these things. Well, if you're going to... Because mm, I was a youth pastor during this time. And the running joke was, what if they did drug education the same way they did sex education? Well, we know you're going to do it. We don't want you to, but if you're going to do it, this is how you protect yourself. Well, we know we're telling you don't do drugs, but if you're going to do drugs... You want to tie that thing right there. You want to find that good vein. Stick it. Somebody hear me? So that's some of what was going on. This is what was taking place. Jesus' verdict against Jezebel is not because of her perversion. Jesus' verdict against her 
was not even because of her deception in the church. Jesus was proclaiming judgment against her because she refused to repent. Do you see that? God does not punish us because of our sin. God punishes us because we refuse to repent. Because I tell you, if you're misbehaving, God's going to correct you. That's why He gave you that conscience. It's the Holy Spirit, ain't Jiminy Cricket? That's the Lord telling you don't do that. Don't go there. Don't say those things. And it's not because of her actions. She was being convicted. And that's what it says. She was being convicted, but she would not repent. This woman... She uh, was dealt with by Christ for some period of time, but she refused to change. She refused to repent. And just like Eli and his sons, I remember back in 1 Samuel, Eli and his sons were misbehaving, and Eli wouldn't correct them. He was just allowing the sin to perpetuate. Let me tell you, this is a New Testament example of an Old Testament failure. You're misbehaving and nobody's getting you to stop. Just as God destroyed Eli and his sons, God is going to punish Jezebel and her followers. Says he's going to cast her down into a bed of suffering. We don't know what that means. Could be sickness. Could be something. But she's going to suffer. And her followers are going to die. you got to be careful who you listen to, friend. You, this is what gets me. This was all taking place in the house of God. Are you hearing me? It means somebody wasn't paying attention to what Scripture said. They're letting a teacher teach a thing that is unbiblical. And do you know why they call them false teachers? Because they take truth and they twist it. They take truth and twist it so that it means not what it's supposed to mean. Somebody's not paying attention. The Lord is walking among the churches and He's calling the unfaithful to repent. He's doing it in this church. I'm telling you right now, Jesus is coming back soon. He's going through this church. He's going through the churches of Florence, Andice, Colleen. He's going through Lampasas. He's going through Kalamazoo. He's going everywhere. Why? Because the time is drawing short. And the Bible says that when the winnowing happens, when the shaking happens, it starts in the house of God. And so God warns. And He says, hey, you need to get your priorities right. Because God likes to judge? No. Because God loves to punish us? No. He loves to forgive. Oh, come on. David wasn't a man after God's own heart because he was angelic. For heaven's sake, the guy was an absolute failure at so many things. So why would God say that? Because he knew how to repent and make things right. He knew not just say, I'm sorry, Lord, forgive me. I am struck in my heart. I'm doing things I don't want to do. Help me not to be that. Help me not to be that. And if we don't repent, we'll be destroyed like Jezebel. But if we do repent, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, He is faithful and just to forgive us. Oh, come on somebody. I love the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Love it. Love it. Many, many people read John's letter to the church here in Thyatira uh, as well as witness what God would do. These letters actually floated. Once they went to the churches, they would float around. Ephesians, Galatians, Colossians. They are written to a church, but then they were made. drafts of it were made and they were scattered around through all the churches so everybody could read all these teachings and all these things that were being said uh, regarding Jesus Christ. And so everybody, people were going to be reading about this church in Thyatira. And they were going to witness. They were going to find out, oh, that woman Jezebel, better suffering. Oh, I heard about that. You remember on Fox News the other day? Because God would never reference CNN. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> it just felt good saying it. 
We heard about that. Ooh. They called it out three months ago and look at it. It's happened. This is a word from God. And we need to pay attention to this word. We can't hide nothing from God. I don't even know you can't hide nothing from God. I remember <laughs> walked up on some guys. They're smoking. Ain't nothing like a preacher to come up and just kill everybody's joy. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. You guys become preachers for a day and see how people start treating you different. It suddenly, you can't see their hands. They walk around like this. You're not going to see what's behind their hands. Why? Because they're holding something they got caught with. And I remember when the guy was smoking and he was... He had taken the drag and he put his hand back down. I'm not about to judge him. I, I personally don't like smoking at all. But it leaves a bad taste in my mouth. But I'm, to me, that's not a heaven or hell issue. That's something else. But they, he had that cigarette in his hand. And I just thought, I want to talk to him for a while. <laughs> Pretty soon that hot ash started chipping on his head. And finally he's like, oh, oh, oh. I said, listen, man. Quit hiding it from me like I'm going to do something about it. Are you hearing me? I'm not here to judge you. You listen to God. If God's not convicting you about it, don't worry about it. If God is convicting you about it, then do something about it. But I am not your judge. But if I see you wearing Maxdale Cowboy t-shirts or a hat and you're misbehaving in public, I will have you. Put on your first Baptist shirt. Praise the Lord. So we can't hide nothing from God. Faithfulness brings reward. Unfaithfulness brings judgment. So look at, let's look at the instruction. Uh, verse 24-25. It says, but I also have a message for the rest of you in Thyatira who have not followed the false teaching, these deeper truths that are actually the depths of Satan. I will ask nothing of you except that you hold tightly to what you have until I come. I believe that the first order of anything is, number one, repent. Repent. I live in an unclean state in an unclean nation, among unclean people. I live among sinners. I do. You do too. But I still sin. You do too. So, Nehemiah gives us the best picture, even though I don't sin like my nation does. And I can be holy because I believe I am holy. I believe I am righteous. Why? Because the Bible says I am. The Bible says you are. But I still got to repent. Why? Because I live here. I live here. I live among them. And I believe that we have to be, first of all, before we do anything else, we have to be a people that says, Lord, forgive me. I may not be doing that but I'm still me. Forgive me. Satan's so-called these deep secrets refers to the teachings of Jezebel that the only way, and I want you to catch this, because this still goes around today. This is still out there. The only way to comprehend grace is to know how Satan works and how he operates in order to destroy him. Now that's, not, that's good. If I'm going to defeat Satan, I need to know how he operates. Man, that's warfare one-on-one. So if I'm going to understand who Satan is, how he works and how he operates, I need to engage in his activities. Oh, wait a minute. What does the Bible say? Where sin does abound, grace does much more abound. So where there's a lot of sin, there's a lot more grace. Hmm. So the more I sin, the more grace I get, the more power of God I have in my life. 
<laughs> Whoa, yeah. Now, does that make sense to anybody here? Do you buy that? False teachers teach that. See, that's what false teaching is. It takes the Word of God and it twists it to where it might actually make some sense. But it's not leading to God. It's not leading to holiness. Where there is sin, grace will be there. What does that mean? doesn't matter how bad Colleen is getting, Jesus is stronger. It doesn't matter how dark Austin is getting, Jesus is brighter. That's what it means. Where there is darkness, God will raise up people of light in their midst. It does not mean if you sin more, you get more of God. You'd be amazed how many people still fall for that line today. That's what was taught 2,000 years ago. And it's still here today. It's still here today. In churches right here in America. So let's wrap this up. He deals with this issue uh, in our instruction. He says, he says uh, well, let's look at the promise. Wait, 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 go back one, go back one. There is this, there is this. He says, I will ask nothing more of you except that you what? Hold tightly. Hang in there, baby. Hang in there. Why? I'm coming. I'm coming. Hang in there. You're going to make it. Now, there's the promise. He ends with this promise, and this is really good. He says this, uh, verse 20. Six, 26, to all who are victorious, who obey me to the very end, to them I will give authority over all the nations. They will rule the nations with an iron rod, smash them like clay pots. They will have the same authority I received from my Father. Do you see that? Somebody needs to get some coffee and some brownies and camp right there. I will have the same authority that Jesus received from His Father. And I will also give them the morning star. Anyone who has ears to hear uh, uh, must listen to the Spirit and understand what He's saying to the churches. There's a modification here that says to the overcomer. Where is it, where is it at? It says, uh, to those who are victorious who obey me to the very end. To those that are victorious. How am I victorious? Because I obey Jesus to the very end. And unfortunately, there's a lot of folk throughout church history that started good, did good, ended terribly. The Bible's full of characters like that. Started good, did good, but ended terribly. If we are an overcomer, if we are this victorious one, it's going to be because we were that way to the end. To the end. Mm. Jesus is trusting us to do His work and to live by His rules. Hang in there. Do it. He says, first of all, they're going to receive authority from God to rule nations. You're going to rule the nations. This is a reversal of the fortunes that the suffering Christians have been dealing with. This church had been suffering just like everybody else. So instead of being suffered and, and spat upon and stepped on, instead you're going to rule the nations. That's a powerful thing. Go back and reread Scripture where it says, you are co-heirs with Christ. You're going to sit on the throne with Jesus. Do you realize how big that throne is? That throne's the size of a love seat. Go meet Jesus. Go sit on it. And you're going to have to wait your turn till I'm done. Hallelujah. Because I get to sit there. Why? Because I'm a co-heir with Christ. Oh, Jesus. I'm a co-heir with Christ. We're going to rule the nations. This is, this is talking about Revelation 19. Jesus comes back. The rapture's already occurred. Jesus is coming back. He's going to set up shop. He's the King of glory for a thousand years and even afterwards. And guess who He's bringing? He's bringing all of us. And guess what? We're all on horseback. Hallelujah! Being a cowboy church, we, the others are laboring behind because them, them poor old 
Lutherans and Presbyterians, they got no clue how to saddle a horse. We're already ready. Jesus said, come on church. Come on cowboy church people. Why? Because you already know what you're doing. Let the blind lead the blind. No, that's not what you're going to say. <laughs> this is thrown back to where Jesus sets up shop and He is the King of the world. And guess what? We rule the world with Him. Oh, come on somebody. Amen. Woo! Woo, woo, woo. Second thing, he says, I'm going to give them the morning star. Do you know what that is? That's Jesus' own name. How do you remember he already said, I'm going to give you a white stone with a new name written on it? Then he says, I'm going to give you another name. I'm giving you my name. And it's going to be that way forever. And we're going to have victory over the darkness of this world. So let's close this out. What are we learning from this? What are we learning from Thyatira? God is telling us to be in the world, but not of the world. Or establishing ourselves as a part of it. I am not going to take the cross off the wall because somebody feels uncomfortable. I'm not going to preach a gospel that's watered down because it might offend somebody. How do you know the word offends? We've all been offended by the word at some point. But what was it? It was conviction. Conviction. We cannot tolerate sin. Now that doesn't mean you come Ramona. To... How do you know that's not what you do? That's not what you do. Ramona. Ramona. I love you. I'm not going to tell, tell what you're saying. Your sin is safe, sister. It's safe. I'm not, I'm not going to tell it to everybody. So we got to be, we, we have got to be a church that's clean. Why? Because I'll tell you, as the world shakes up, they're looking for somewhere to run. People in Israel are looking for somewhere to run. People in Gaza are looking for somewhere to run. People right here in America, as I mean, stuff is hitting the fan. They don't know where to go or what to do. Can I tell you, they're looking for something. And the last thing they need is to come into a church that's sick, anemic, impotent, and fighting. It has got to be a church that's healthy and strong and has the answers that they're looking for. That's the whole reason they're coming to church. I've watched them, even since I've been here, preach the Word. Somebody I don't even know, and they're sitting out here in a chair, and tears are flowing out their face. Why? Because the Word of God is hitting them. It's hitting them. I'd sure like to pat myself on the back, Jason, and say, Oh my... Look how good I did today. No, come on, man. This is a talking donkey right here. The Word of God. The Word of God impacted the heart. Why? Because there's a healthy spirit in the house. Somebody hearing me. This is who we got to be. Because if we're not, God won't bring them here. Why would God bring somebody here so they could be led into deception? Why would God bring somebody here because they're going to be looked down on? Why are they God going to bring somebody here so they can get beat up? God is good. And we need people to know that. And if they're going to know God is good, we got to be good. Lord, I thank you. And I love you because you're so good. And Lord, I just pray right now, help us to be the church that you need for us to be for such a time as this. For such a time as this. Lord, let us be healthy as people. Lord, forgive me of my sins. Lord, I repent of my sins. God, I ask you to forgive me. Just as I'd want anybody else to pray this prayer. God, I mean, I'm asking for myself. I am sorry. Forgive me. And Lord God, lead me into better ways and better days. 
Help me to be the man of God you need me to be. Help yeah. us to be the people of God you need us to be so that this church can be the church you need it to be for this area for such a time as this. God, I pray, let us be found faithful. Weigh us and measure us. and Let us be found faithful. Lord, I love you. Help me to love you more. Watch over us and keep us. Lord, I pray for everybody that goes home tonight. God, let them go home in a cocoon of love, feeling the Holy Spirit all around them. I pray that, Lord God, you give us all safety going home. And tomorrow, help us to just tear a hole in hell. Help us to do good for you tomorrow. Lead us, use us. Help us to make heaven just a little bit bigger. And get us ready for whatever you're going to do Sunday, Lord God, to touch lives. And Father, we want to give you the thanks and the praise for this day and the rain that's coming. In Jesus' name. Somebody said amen.